also want to uh, give special thanks. It's an honor for me to, to be able to speak at the same program as Rosh Shiner. The topic is Yerushalayim is ours, should nothing be changed. Well, that, that's all right, thank you. The Nachim Tefillah is introduced into the Shemona Esrei at Mincha on Tishavah. I didn't actually bring you on the sheet to the current edition of Nachim. I brought you instead the original, which is found in the Yerushalmi in Brachos, it's source number one. Ravacha bar Yitzchak b'shem rabichia de Tzipaurin. He tells us, Yachid b'tishabav, an individual davening on Tishabav, Tzarech lahazkir me'ein hama'ora, has to mention something in his davening, in his Shmona Esrei, that reflects what happened on that day. Ma'u Omer, so what does he say? Here's the addition. Rachem Hashem Elokeinu b'rachamecha harabim. Hashem, in your great mercy, have mercy upon us. U'bechazcha ne'amonim, and in your, your faithful chesed, for us, for your nation Israel, your city, we're familiar with these phrases, we've seen them elsewhere aside from Nachim, and for the city that is grieving, for the city that is desolate, for the city that is destroyed, for the city that is in ruins, which is given into the hands of strangers, that has been trampled in the hands of wicked people, the Yerashua Ligionos, it was conquered by legions, by Echalua of Deb Silim, worshippers of idols have desecrated it, Oli Yisrael Amcha Nasat Anachla was supposed to be given to us as our portion, the, uh, and then there's the, the quote of the Psukim that Hashem is going to rebuild it with fire just as it was destroyed in fire. That's the original version of Nachem, and it exists to this day in slightly altered form. And you see it starts here with Rachem rather than Nachem. The, um, there's also another change that over time develops in terms of where it's said in the Shemona Esrei. Is it said in Ritzei? Is it said in Bial Kulam? Is it said in the, uh, the Bracha of the rebuilding of Yerushalayim? The uh, somewhat altered editions appear in the earliest Siddurim we have from the period of the Gaon and the Siddur of Amram Gaon or Sajjah Gaon. The, um, in the Rishalmi, it seems to be said at each tefillah, whereas among the Rishonim, they change it to appear specifically at Mincha. In the Rishalmi, it doesn't have its own ending of Baruch Atah Hashem. That only appears in the period of the Gaonim. But the key line that I want to address this morning is the description of Yerushalayim as Ha'ir ha'avelah, the city that is grieving, ha'chariva, that's in ruins, ha'harusa, that's destroyed, or as it appears in our own edition of Nachem, ha'ir ha'chariva, ha'bizuya, ha'shomema, the city that is ruined, the city that is disgraced, the city that is desolate, mi belib baneha, that doesn't have its children in it, yoshevas v'chaverosha ha'fui, it sits and its head is covered, dot, dot, dot. The, um, the, the, the question arose in the year 1967, when control of the city was restored to us, um, should we still call it the city that is kareva, that is destroyed? Should we still call it the city that is in a disgrace? Does that reflect what we actually see? So Rav Shlomo Gorin, in fact, recommended in 1967 that it should revert to the text of the Yerushalmi, because the text of the Yerushalmi, he felt, reflected more the state of the city in the sense that it was a city that had been ruined, it still wasn't built up, and he felt that, re that reflected the city, as opposed to the text that we have, which talks about her children not living in her, because now we do live in her. Rav Chaim Dov and Alevi, a major posik of the period, said, you know what, use the past tense. Say, the city that was destroyed, the city that had been desolate, the city that at one point didn't have her, her children living in her. Rav David Shlush said, you know what, change the focus. Continue to say Nachem, but not about the city, instead about the base Hamikdash, because we still don't have a base Hamikdash. Those were three recommendations. On the other hand, Major Postkim weighed in and said, don't change it. The robber of Soloveitchik said not to change it. Rovadi Yosef said not to change it. Rav Tzvi Yehuda Kuk said not to change it. If you take a look at source number three, you find the statement by Rav Tzvi Yehuda Kuk. He says, Ein adayin makom He wrote it in an article in 1967. He says, there is still no room for making changes. He said, as long as we can't rebuild the base Hamikdash, the pain endures. 
And in source number four, you find a citation of Rotsvi Yehuda Kuk from Rosh Shlomo Abiner. More recently, he wrote, Yerushalayim is in the category of degraded. Yerushalayim he begedder b'zuya b'shomema kol o lo nivne ha-mikdash, as long as the base ha-mikdash is not rebuilt. She'igri Yerushalayim, who base ha-mikdash? If you don't have a base ha-mikdash, it's not Yerushalayim. The fundamental identity of Yerushalayim is the location of the base ha-mikdash. There were other reasons that were brought not to change it. The Rav and Rav Avadya both emphasized that the addition is still accurate since it refers to the Beis HaMikdash. Rav Avadya Yosef added to that and said, look at the spiritual state of the population. It's not at the level you're supposed to have when you have a Beis HaMikdash, and that's another note that he added. And then part of the debate was about the origin of the text itself. Rav Avadya Yosef contended that the text we have for Nachim goes back to the Anshe Knesset Hagadola. It's built around Sukkim and it goes back to the great assembly itself. That was his, uh, his contention. If you take a look at source number six, from his tshuva on the topic in the Yafav Adas, he says, in the introduction to Rav Sadra Gaon's Siddur, it's explained that in tefillos and matbeah habrachos and usomchem al makubel biyadenu b'misorah minivie Hashem that when it comes to the davening in the format of our brachos, our blessings, we depend upon the text that we received from the prophets, the Anshei Knesset Hagadola and the Great Assembly from the beginning of the second base Hamikdash. Shahiu lehem shnei sedarim betefilos seder echad lezman malchus Yisrael v'seder echad hamiyuhad lezman agalos. He says, you know what? The Anshei Knesset Hagadola writing in the beginning of the second Beis HaMikdash, developed two types of tefillah. One for the time when you have a Beis HaMikdash, and one for the time when you don't have a Beis HaMikdash. They have the foresight to say there is going to be a period when the Jews are going to be in Galos, and they're going to need star tefillahs, tefillahs that they're not going to come up with then, but that we will have designed with the Nevi'im among us now. And the Ravadja quotes the Gemara in Nazir in a separate context, which says that the Chachamim knew that the Beis HaMikdash was going to be destroyed, and that's the, uh, that's the idea. This idea that the sages already knew that they would be going into Golos, into exile, and they created laws with that in mind, does not appear uniquely here. It appears elsewhere as well. Tosos in Gitin, at source number seven, talks about the prosbol enactment of Hillel. There's a big problem, and I'm not going to go into the whole prosbol discussion right now, but basically we have a law that says that loans that are due before Shemitah are nullified come the end of the Shemitah year. But Hillel creates the prosbol institution which allows loans to survive the nullification that should occur in Shemitah. And there's some debate as to what exactly he did and how he did it, but within the view of Tosfos, he's essentially overriding an existing law. And the problem is that Shemitah's Tzafim, the idea that these loans should be nullified, is a biblical law. So how can Hillel create a rabbinic enactment that's going to nullify a biblical law? And Tosfos' answer is that during the second base Hamikdash, the time of Hillel, indeed, Shemitah is still biblical. That's the position Tosfos takes. However, Hillel doesn't create the prosbol for that period of time. Hillel creates the prosbol for this anticipated period when the Beis Hamikdash is going to be destroyed, and that's when it's going to take into effect. That's when it's going to take effect. If you see, source number seven from Tosfos Lotika and Hillel prosbol the Doro, Shrei Hayav is Manabayas El La Achar Churban Davayadi the Tharuv Beisa. He created this for the period when the Beis Hamikdash would already be destroyed. Then Shmita would become a Derabanan, and at that point it would uh, it would take effect. It's a remarkable position that, um, that Tosos takes there, Ramban, and protests and says, God forbid, you can't think of a greater al tiftach pelasatam than creating a law and saying, well, this will come into effect when the Beis HaMikdash is destroyed. You're just, you're just asking for trouble. Nonetheless, that's the position of Rav Ovadia regarding Nachem. It was actually created by the Anshe Knesset Hagadola in anticipation of a later time. The, um, and that's one view. The alternative view is that, in fact, Nachim has been changed over time. It had one text that we saw in the Yerushalmi, but it had, to, but it had been modified later on. This is also not unique to Nachim. Ramban makes the same point regarding benching. We are taught that Shlomo HaMelech enacted a brach on Birkas Hamazon for Yerushalayim. The addition that we say in the bracha for Yerushalayim starts, well, that starts, it concludes, Uvnei Yerushalayim, Rakodesh, from Herav Yameinu. We ask Hashem to build Yerushalayim. Shlomo HaMelech 
would not have created a bracha saying Uvnei Yerushalayim. And so Ramban explains it's in source number eight in his commentary to the Sefer Mitzvot. He says. The core idea of benching is, of course, biblical, and the Gemara explains that. Ramban says, benching is, mandatory, is mandated biblically. The Nevi'im give us what we're supposed to do, what the brachas are supposed to speak about, and in the, in the course of going into Golos, we change the bracha for Yerushalayim to reflect this tefillah that it should be rebuilt. So says Ramban on Birkas Hamazon. So there are some who suggest that just as Ramban can say regarding Birkas Hamazon that it was altered to reflect the reality we needed to daven for Binyan Beis Hamikdash, so too we, uh, we would need to, we would need to change nothing to reflect a new reality. As I said before, Ravadya was very against this. He felt the text is old and does not get changed. Rosolovechik was against this. Rosolovechik invaded heavily against the idea of changing davening at all, what he called creative lit liturgy. He felt we have we had Chachamim, we had Nevi'im in the Anshik Nesis Hagadola, and we don't uh, and we don't tamper with tefillah, we don't create tefillah. As he put it, the uh, davening is supposed to reflect a conversation with Hashem. It's not something that you can just uh, that you can just write. So we have two schools of thought. The uh, one school of thought saying change the line because it doesn't reflect Yerushalayim as we have it now. The other school of thought saying, don't change it. And within the school of thought that says, don't change it, we have two primary reasons that we, uh, just to sum it up. Number one, this tefillah is old and we don't change tefillah. And number two, a view we brought a few minutes back, which says the reason we don't change it is that you don't have a base hamikdash. Within the view of the Rav and Rav Avadya, that we that it's, it's about the loss we suffer, I have a question. And my question is, if we're really talking about the loss of the Mikdash, why do we word it about Yerushalayim at all? What change is there in the nature of Yerushalayim in the absence of a base of Mikdash? And I'd like to identify three different ways in which Yerushalayim is different in the absence of a base of Mikdash. You see it there on your sheet in the heading, social, religious, and aesthetic. First of all, the social character of the city. In the time when we have the base of Mikdash, we are taught there are ten Nisim. Ten miracles that are associated with the Beis HaMikdash, but not all of them take place in the Mikdash itself. One of those that's listed in the Mishnah in Pirkei Avos that gives us the, 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 um, the list of ten, take a look at source number nine, Ten miracles took place for our ancestors in the Beis HaMikdash, and one of them is, No one ever said to somebody else, there's no room for me to stay in Yerushalayim. No one ever said, I'm out of space in the city. This doesn't take place in the Beis HaMikdash. This is not talking about Ondim Tzlufim, Mishtachim, and Rabachim, people cramming into a cramped space in the Beis HaMikdash and miraculously finding room. This means in the city itself, people came for Ali el Regel, they came for Yom Tov, and they never said, I don't have room. So the Sadegera Rebbe said, why is it that no one was blocked out? Why is it that everybody had room? Because each one was Sameach Bechelko. Each one was happy with what he had. And that is one of the nisim that occurred when we had a Beis HaMikdash. Not just the Kedusha of the place, but the Ben Adam Lamakom feeling of the place. Hashem engineered a nais. We could use this nais today. That everybody in Yerushalayim, we could use it beyond Yerushalayim, but that everybody felt happy with what they had. This is one of the Asara nisim. It's one of those ten miracles. And as a matter of fact, loss of that phenomenon leads to the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. Remember the Gemara Bav Metziah, I brought it here in source number 10. Lo nechrevo Yerushalayim, elam ibnei she'emidu divreyam al din Torah. Yerushalayim is destroyed when people say, I have my rights. The Torah gives me certain rights and I'm going to demand it of you. I'm not willing to go lefnim mishures hadin, beyond the letter of the law, in dealing with other people. When people stop going beyond the letter of the law for others, when we lose that nakes, of everybody feeling a sense of achdus, that's the time of the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. <coughs> so number one, when we had a Mikdash, we had greater unity within the city. People were willing to forgive to each other. Number two, and perhaps the most obvious of the three, is Ben Adam Lamakom. The loss that comes with the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash is the loss in our relationship with Hashem. And much of what I'm going to say on this Ben Adam Lamakom piece comes from uh, Ram Gurbich in his uh, Or Ram. 
he pointed out, Pasuk in Eicha, take a look at source number 11. It says, Zekenem mishar shavasu, bachurim and minigina sam. The elders ceased from the gate, and the young ceased from their singing. The kids stopped singing. And in fact, we see this also in the Kino of Elitzia, right? Alei hagyon metholeha, asher damam be'orea. Did I put it on the sheet? No, I did not. The val bad asher shamem ubi tul sanhedra. The, um, about the ceasing of, the loss of, the singing and the dancing of the young in their cities, and the loss as well of the Sanhedrin. The Gemara in Sota is our source for this. It's source number 12. Mishabala Sanhedrin batel hashir mi beis hamishtaos. When the Sanhedrin ceased to exist, at that point song was lost from the beis hamishta. And they give you the Pasuk that I quoted from Eicha as the, uh, as the basis for that. So it sounds like from the Pasuk in Eicha, from the Kina, and from the Gemara in Sota, what we're saying is the Sanhedrin stops meeting. Remember, where did the Sanhedrin meet? Lishkasagazis, in the Beis Hamikdash, until they left. That's where they sat. When the Sanhedrin left the Beis Hamikdash, it sounds like naturally people just stopped singing. But the Rishalmi says that that's not what's going on. The Rishalmi in Sota in Source 13 explains that the Chachamim made a decree that they couldn't sing anymore. This is reflected also in Igmar and Gid that they, they stopped singing because the Chachamim said you have to stop singing because when you had a Sanhedrin in the Beis Hamikdash, there was a sense of awe in general in the population. To see that gathering of leaders together sitting in the Sanhedrin inspired such yira, inspired such awe, that people, when they sang, even though they're singing when they're slightly inebriated, perhaps in the Beis Hamishteh, nonetheless, they maintained a degree of propriety in their singing that was lost with the loss of the Sanhedrin. There wasn't the same year off. There wasn't the same awe. Along similar lines, we have a mission in Pirkei Avos, source 14. Yehuda ben Tema said, da da da, and then it concludes with the Yehi Ratzon. Yehi Ratzon l'fanecha Hashem alokeinu may be your will Hashem, shetibane ircha b'mhera b'yameinu, that your city should be rebuilt speedily in our days, v'sein chalkeinu b'sara secha, and give us our share in your Torah. Notice the association. Hashem rebuild Yerushalayim, and when you rebuild Yerushalayim, I will have my share in your Torah. What's the association between rebuilding Yerushalayim and me having my share in the, uh, in the Torah? What's the link between the, between the two of them? So take a look at source 15, the story of Yoshua ben Gamla. Yoshua ben Gamla is the Kohen Gadol. His wife, Martha Bas Baisus, buys the Kahuna Gadola for him. And Yoshua ben Gamla does some incredible things, including sponsoring and initiating the creation of public schools so that those who don't have parents who can teach them Torah will end up learning in these public schools. And at one point, he sets up the school specifically in Yerushalayim. Then it doesn't work. Not everybody can make it to Yerushalayim, and so they set it up in the cities instead. Why does he insist on setting it up in Yerushalayim? Well, the Pasuk says, Ki mitzion te Torah. Torah emerges from Zion. But take a look at source 16, comment from Toskos. He says, Lepisha Yeroa Kedusha Gedola, because what would happen is, you would come to Yerushalayim to learn. You would see the great Kedusha, you would see the great sanctity. The Kohenim Oskim Ba'avoda, the Kohenim at work in the service in the Beis HaMikdash. Hayimachaveh Libo Yoser Liyira Shemayim Velomo Torah, and that would motivate people to a greater awe of heaven, it would motivate people to a greater study of Torah. Having the Beis HaMikdash in Yerushalayim increases our sense of awe and increases our commitment to Torah. We do it in our own davening as well. Right? We say Yehi Ratzon also, Sheibana Beis Hamikdash from Heri Amenu Vesein Chalkeinu Vesara Secha. Right? We do it at the end of Shmona Esrei. We ask for the Beis Hamikdash to be rebuilt and associated with that to have our share in Torah. The rebuilding of the Beis Hamikdash, the restoration of Yerushalayim as the center for Hashem's communication with us as the place of Avoda, builds up our own portion in Torah. I also brought you in Source 17, of course, the Sanhedrin itself is the seat of Torah Shabbat Pet. It's the essence of that communication between Hashem and us. So our second piece of why we can say that Yerushalayim is itself considered to be Chareva B'zuya in the absence of a Beis HaMikdash is because it doesn't inspire, the city doesn't inspire the same Yerash Hashem and the same Torah 
without a base hamikdash at its center. And that's the second. And then third and finally, it's about the beauty and the wealth of the city itself. I brought you here in choice 18, the Mishnah's depiction of the parade of the Bikurim. When you brought the first fruits to Yerushalayim, people brought baskets. If they were wealthy, they brought gold baskets. If they weren't as wealthy, they brought branches and they interwove them. And they all gathered together in their cities and they marched to Yerushalayim. And you see the description about the different fruit that people brought, how they had oxen walking in front of them with horns plated with gold and olive wreaths on the heads of the animals. And they had, they, they had musical instruments and they sent messengers and everybody he came out of Jerusalem to greet them. The king himself came out to greet them. They released birds. This was a, an incredible celebration, the, uh, the, the march of the Bikurim. In the absence of the Beis HaMikdash, we don't have it. Take a look at source number 19, the Gemara and Rosh Hashanah. Karim Rabbi HaYaola Yerushalayim Malach Yom Lafol Etzad. You had a grapevine the first three years. You couldn't use the grapes. In the fourth year, you brought the grapes to Yerushalayim from one day's radius. Why did you make sure to bring the grapes and not simply redeem them for money, which was another option, and use the money in Yerushalayim to buy food? La'atir shuke Yerushalayim beperos. To make sure that the markets of Yerushalayim would be decorated with fruit. There's the, the, the beauty of the city itself which is augmented by these mitzvahs that are associated with the, uh, with the Beis HaMikdash. It's also the beauty of the people. If you take a look at Source 20, it's a, it, it, it's a, a terrible story. But take a look at the story from the Mishnah in the Dharam. There was a practice in the time of the uh, in the time of the Beis Hamikdash. I'm sorry, the time of the Beis Hamikdash. In the time of the Gemara, the, uh, there was a practice of having men marry their nieces, and the idea was that if one's niece was not able to find a shidduch, she wasn't able to get married, she needed to be protected within the family economically. It wasn't easy for a woman to, uh, to make her living on her own. And so, what it would often happen in the days when a man could marry more than one wife, is that he would take in his niece, he would shelter his niece, marrying her and making her a part of his home. So there was a man who was supposed to do this, and he refused, and he took a vow that he wouldn't benefit her in order to guarantee there's no way he's going to marry her. So they bring her into the house of Rabbi Ishmael, and they pretty her up. And the Gemara on this explains, they gave her food, she didn't have proper nutrition, and they bathed her, she hadn't been bathed. And then Rabbi Ishmael says to him, is this the woman about whom you took such a vow? And he says, no way, I didn't take such a vow about that. And Rabbi Yishmael cries and says, Benos Yisrael knows, and El Shaha Nius Min a theme we find in the Kinos as well, the, um, that we're beautiful. But the poverty and the destruction is what makes us, uh, is what makes us appear ugly. The, um, in sum, we say in the Kinos, in the, begin in, Eicha, in the beginning of the fourth parak, Eicha Yu Am Zahav. How is it that the gold has become dimmed? That's a reference to Yoshiyahu, but it's also a reference to Yerushalayim Shel Zahab, the city which we associate with gold. The, um, the Medrash in Echarabah says that the gold has been dimmed, the gold has been covered up, the gold has been changed. And that's what we're talking about here. When Rav Avadya says, and when Rav Salavechik says, that Yerushalayim without a Beis Hamikdash is still considered to be in a ruined state, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about the loss of the Benar Machavero, the social aspect. They're talking about the loss of the spiritual aspect as well when you have a Beis Hamikdash with a Sanhedrin. And they're talking as well about the loss of the physical beauty associated with the mitzvahs of the Beis Hamikdash. You know, today, we live in an era that you could call an era of Shabbat Chazon, in a sense. Yesterday was Shabbat Chazon. And we went through Shabbos sort of on a weird balance, where on the one hand, you know it's the nine days you're leading into Tisha B'Av. It's a miserable time to commemorate loss. We read the Haftar of Chazon, this horrifying, frightening first parak in, uh, in Yeshaya, where Hashem says, I don't want you to celebrate, I don't want you to come to my base Hamikdash. And then on the other hand, it was Shabbos. And we had Shabbos meals, and we sang at the table, and all of that. We are living in an era which is an era of Shabbos Chazam. It's an era in which, on the one hand, we still lack the Beis HaMikdash, and on the other hand, we have so much that's been restored to us. It's the time for us to do whatever we can to be metake and to repair these three levels. The level of Benar al-Machavero, the social, the level of Benar al-Makon, between us and Hashem, and the beauty of the city itself, building up the city of, of Yerushalayim. 
for Soloveitchik noted that, for, that we only say Nachem at Mincha, even though the Rishalmi has us saying it at every Shemana essay, we only do it at Mincha. Because the first part of Tisha B'av is a period that Yirmiya calls Sasam Tfilasi. My prayers were cut off. Hashem didn't want to hear what I had to say. But the moment that we can say Nachem on Tisha B'av afternoon, the moment that we can say, Hashem, please comfort us, we already begin the consolation process, and we begin the tshuva process as well. It's a statement that we recognize the problem, and we commit ourselves to correct it. May we this year recognize the problem as identified on these three levels, the social, the connection between us and Hashem, and the beauty of the city, and merit and the fulfillment of the Gemara in, uh, the fulfillment of the Gemara in Tanis that says, that Kalamis Abala Yerushalayim, those who mourn for Yerushalayim, Zoch Tavroa Bissim Chasa, will merit to see its joy.